last day that I'm going to be 47 years old. I 48 tomorrow. But there's a psychological transition happening. Like I, I'm like in my 40s now. I'm like 50. Like I am about to be 50. And there's this interesting phenomenon that happens as you age. And I know all of you are aging with me. But ha have you ever like you're at a certain age, but you feel like you're a different age? Yeah. It's like for people in their 30s, at least for me, I hit my mid 30s. I still felt like I was like 23, 25, somewhere in there. But when 42, 43 hit, oh, I am definitely 42 and 43. And then the other phenomenon that happens is I, I look at my parents when they were 50, and I'm like, that was so old. <laughs> and now I'm 50 going, totally not that old. There's so much left of life. So it's a weird psychological transition happening right now. So anyways, 50 is coming. And uh, for all you 50-year-old, I have looked. I always thought that was old. It's not. It's so not old. So anyway, I don't know. Maybe the question is, at what point do you start? I mean, is it, you start feeling really old. 99? I don't know. Is it like is it that long away? I don't know. So, well, I'm excited. We're going to finish up our generosity series. We're going to put a period on this chapter. It is definitely not the end. Uh, we are realizing more and more. It feels like we're just scratching the surface of this concept of generosity. And as you dive into scripture, there's so many different things that God has to say and people that God highlighted to write books for the Bible, had a lot to say and think about when it comes to finances, when it comes to money, when it comes to resources, and the whole concept of generosity. I'm going to do a quick recap. If you are not a note taker, today is going to be a great day to take notes. If you are a note taker, you're going to have a feast of notes today. We're going to cover a bit of, this is a teaching, I want to teach through some concepts today. But to quickly recap, our first week, we asked the question, what is your relationship with money? How would you define your relationship with money? And then the question of, how does money relate to you? And it's an important question to ask, that if you don't identify that, then you won't get to some of the root causes of why you do what you do or actually understand why you do what you do when it comes to your resources, your time, and your money, et cetera. The second week, Candace took it, and Candace kind of tackled the topic of generosity as a human being. As human, we want our life to be one of generosity. No matter how you slice our life open, you constantly run into a generous spirit, someone that constantly is looking for ways to be generous with your time, your resources, et cetera. And then week three, Candace already mentioned it, but Stephen Gillum over here did a phenomenal job last week. How many were here last week? A bunch of you. So grateful, and he inspired me. I thought I had high standards on dreams of how to be generous, but when he shared about his dream is to give away millions of dollars, I thought, man, that's amazing. And he taught us about generosity as at being a cheerful giver, doing it with joy and excitement that we don't have to do it under compulsion or manipulation or force, but actually become a, becoming a cheerful giver. But the part that I love he brought into it was attaching faith to the dreams of being generous. Like, God, I want you to bless me so I can be this generous in the future and today. And so I was really grateful for that. Today, we're going to continue our conversation around generosity, but we're going to kind of hone in specifically on the topic of tithing. We're going to tackle that. But before I get into that, I want to continue to preface each talk that we do. I understand that everyone in this room has a different relationship with money, and you have a different history on the conversation of money and how it intersects with church. I understand many of you in this room, you've been involved in church for a long period of your life. Some of you are brand new to the faith, and this is a rather new conversation. And I want to normalize the conversation around finances and money, and obviously tithing and offering and all the conversations around. I want to normalize it. I don't want to avoid it. I want it to be up in front, and I want us to have conversation together like this, but even more when you go home and you're interacting with your friends and poking holes in thought and because I believe there's principles in here that God had actually set up for us to actually embrace and run with and so we are creating conversation but what we did we actually did a survey and a lot of you filled it out so I just want to say thank you to those that did the survey there's actually 32 slides which we're not going to do all 32 our, our very own Luke Onsbach who happened to be our resident survey data expert at the moment he took the data and 
turned it into beautiful slides and actually pulled out some really helpful information. I'm only going to show you four slides today just to give you an idea of kind of the, the landscape of this room and specifically the broader studio community. So let's go ahead and show the first slide. And the first question we asked in the survey was, is it, it is, appropriate, is it appropriate to teach on the topic of money at church? As you can see, the dominant perspective is it is appropriate to teach on this topic in church. And that would actually, I would actually be surprised at how many people felt it was appropriate. I had no grid, I was kind of guessing. But what I want to highlight is you can see the scale goes down to strongly disagree. The numbers are rather small and nominal, but I highlight that specifically for this reason. There are people in this community that are still struggling with this concept. And what I want to do, this whole series has been an invitation to engage with something that I believe and we believe is actually a principle within the scriptures of what God actually gives beautiful instruction on. And we're going to talk some more about that today. But that's really to understand kind of who's in the room. And I don't want to forget the person that, the people that are on the other end of the spectrum that strongly disagree. Because I want this to be a conversation and an invitation. So let's go to the next slide. The second question that we asked in the survey was, have you ever been taught about money, tithing, or giving in a church setting? As you can see, the overwhelming majority have said, yes, I've been taught this. And as you can see, you can go down the list of a small percentage of people that haven't. What was interesting about this statistic and some of the questions, or not questions, but some of the uh, information you gave us, is the ones that have been taught about finances and money are the ones that also have the most concerns about what's being taught. And then the ones that have never been taught had zero concerns about being taught about it. I just found that really interesting because it tells me that all of us have different experiences. Some are bad, some are good, and some are mixed, that we all have our own journey of this conversation. So let's go to the third slide. The first slide, the question we asked was, as we move into discussing the area of finances, how comfortable are you with the specific topics of giving and tithing being taught in the church? Again, this is another data point to kind of see the broader scale of who the more dominant perspective, very comfortable, all the way down to very comfortable. Again, this highlights that this is who we're made up of, and this is the ongoing conversation and an invitation into this topic. The last slide is particularly my favorite, so let's go to that one. This one is actually based around the question, in your current season of life, what would you like to learn about regarding finances, tithing, and or money in general. I love this slide because it actually gives us a little bit of a blueprint of what we can do as a community to help raise our financial awareness around what the Bible said about finances, as well as just personal finances, as well as management, investments, and stewardship. And you can kind of see, I would say for the top 10 to 11 different categories, there's a pretty even percentage spread or I would say a desire of what we would like to grow in in areas in our life. And if you look at the top, the top one that most people, I want to grow in just practical management of my own finances. Now, I'll say this, studio is not the end all to how you manage your finances. We just want to be a helpful added resource, but also, but we will primarily focus on biblical stuff because that's what we're doing here. But there's lots of great resources, and I know in the future we definitely want to point people in certain direction. But I found this really helpful to understand what the desires are within our community to grow. And what I love is not just about getting by. It's actually about how do I invest and steward my finances for the future. There's so many great moments in that. And so that's some helpful information of some of the results of the survey. As we talk about money today, we seem to preface it with, oh, we're talking about this because we live in a Western Christian context. Uh, I would like to propose that is not why we talk about money in church today. Sometimes we think that only Western Christians struggle or need input or biblical guidance on actually what to do with money. I would like to propose to you, this is not a Western Christian conversation or slash issue. It is actually a human issue, and even a smaller version of that, it's a follower of Jesus conversation. 
that the whole idea, the reason why we talk about finances and money is not because we just live in the West where money is king and that's what everybody aspires to have or at least have to fight the struggles of aspiring to have. I want to tell you when you look at Scripture from the beginning of Scripture throughout Scripture, it was a conversation that God had been having with humans from the beginning of how to manage your money, your resources, your assets, whatever it was that had value. We just live in a day and age where our money is attached to something that has value. There are eras in human history where there may not be a dollar bill or coin, but whatever you possessed had value that was worth doing something with. So I am highlighting all this because this is not a Western Christian conversation. This is just a human conversation, and because we've chosen to follow God, he actually has a lot to say on this from day one all the way to this day, May 5th, 2024. And there's another part of this conversation in regards to God is hardwired into our humanity. It's so intrinsic, and we all experience it on some level. Have you ever done something thoughtful for someone, maybe saved money or you heard someone was in need and you gather with your friends and say, hey, do you want to go in on this? Let's, let's make sure this person doesn't lack in this area. And you organize it or your own wallet, whatever it was, and then you go to that person and you say, hey, listen, you don't know this, but a bunch of us have been talking and we heard you're in need and here you go. We want to take care of whatever this need or abundance. Something happens inside you when that moment happens. It's this overwhelming sense of gratitude of appreciation. You have emotions that are just beautiful, like, and you kind of become addicted to it, like, man, I like this. I like what this does to me as a human being because it's intrinsic. It's something that God has hardwired into your moral, into your ethics, into who you are as a human being. So that emotion is something that God actually placed in you, and you get to experience it when you tap into it. And I would also say there are other emotions, such as greed, lust, coveting, fear, anxiety. All these emotions are within our humanity. And these are the emotions that we are in a tug of war with. If we are to be honest about this, we're in a tug of war of fear, anxiety in the area of our finances. Like, I know I'm not supposed to be fearful. I'm supposed to be someone that just has no fear, but why am I struggling with this? And this is a real human dilemma when it comes to this topic. But thankfully, we're not left to our own abilities, our own devices, our own mechanism to solve that. We've chosen to follow a God that actually addresses it. And he actually gives guidance of what to do even if you struggle with fear, anxiety, greed, and lust, all these other human emotions and experiences that we have. So I want to propose to you, as we go into this conversation today, understand that your finances what you do with it, why you do what you do with it, is connected to your spiritual formation. In my biblical studies at Bethany University, there was one class in particular, that's a really small class, Professor Brewster was a great man, the short man, he was kind of a barrel of an individual, you give him a hug and just, you, know, you just felt like you were hugging something of substance. And he was just this kindest man, I just really loved him. And, he asked this question in this class. There were about 13 to 15 students. It was a smaller class, and we're all studying, obviously, Bible and preaching and pastoring. And we're, just, we're doing all the biblical studies. And he asked this question, is it appropriate to talk about money in church? Same question we've asked you guys. And because of the way we were situated, it was kind of a semicircle, and he was in the middle, in the front, the person on the other end of the circle, and I happened to be on the other end. The person on the other end of the circle started first and said, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's appropriate. You've got to be really careful. And, and he kind of gave his answer. The next person said something similar. And the conversation kind of turned into, should you take an offering or receive an offering during the gathering or tithe an offering during the gathering? And somebody said, no, you should avoid it. You should have a box in the back. And if people want to, they can put you know, the tithe and offering in it. And, and the whole room is kind of on this rhetoric of like, eh, you know, just just kind of don't go there. And I got me and I looked at my classmates and I said, I disagree with all of you. I said, if no one's going to teach the Bible on this topic, we have a bigger problem. I actually believe this topic is directly connected to your spiritual formation. Let me define to you what spiritual formation actually is. 
it is the ongoing process where you and I are learning and to develop right relationship with God, with self, and others. And they are formed spiritually to act and behave in Christ's likeness. So this conversation of money is not outside of being spiritually formed. It is integral and it's a big part of being spiritually formed. And I want to put that out before you because for some of you, you need to rethink your perspective on finances because it's actually a part of your spiritual formation because God has a lot to say on the actual topic. And it's something that we must invite him in to shape and form us. It's an area in our life where we don't want to just be left to our own devices and mechanisms of how to manage it. We actually want God to guide us and shape us and form us. And what we will learn is God will be more focusing on emphasizing the heart because when he can get your heart in a place that resembles and looks and feels and sounds like Jesus, generosity is the easiest thing on the planet. So I want to introduce you today, your finances, what you do with that, it's a spiritual formation conversation. But alongside that, let me also address, sometimes when we talk about money in the church or money in the Christian faith, the only thing that gets emphasized or only one dimension that gets emphasized is this, it's wrong to have money. You should give it all away. Money is evil. Possessions are evil. And I just want to tell you, that's a disservice to all of us if that's the only dimension of finances that we talk about. Because if you look at the scope of Scripture, it is so clear that God teaches you how to steward your finances to increase, how to manage your finances to increase so you can become a resource. So all the conversations around money can't only be around get rid of it all, it's all bad, and have nothing. Because God is actually in the business of helping you to increase your blessings, your abundances. There may be seasons where it's emphasized more than the other, but it's a process, it's a journey, it's not only one dimension. So if that is your only experience of sitting in an environment like this where someone has taught you only one dimension, which is give it all away. There have been seasons of our life like give it all away, and it's like, ouch. But guess what's amazing what God actually brings back into your life at a different season. That's the beauty of sowing and reaping. So I want to just, in a way, just clarify for us as a community, our heart is that we talk about all of the topic, not just one dimension of it. And for some of you who've only heard, give everything to the church. Somebody said, someone, a pastor told me, you need to cash out your retirement and give it to church because that's what God wants you to do. Now, I'm not, I am not that pastor to go, he was right or wrong. I'm not in a position to say he was right or wrong. My point is this, if you have only heard to give it all away. I just also want to say God also has a lot to say about how to save, how to invest, how to steward uh, to a place of increase. And that's what I want you to hear. It's a broader conversation. So if you will, would you at least turn with me to Leviticus? If you don't know where that is, that is in the very beginning, a couple books in to your right. Leviticus chapter 19. I'm going to read you a, uh, a handful of scriptures. This is the only one that I want you to turn with me. The other one you can write down and look at, at it later. But in Leviticus 19, verses 9 and 10, it says this, When you reap the harvest of your land, you are not to reap the very edge of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not strip your vineyard bare or gather its fallen grapes. Leave them for the poor and the resident alien. I am the Lord your God. Let's stop right here. I love this passage. This is one angle that God talked about generosity. He said, hey, listen, when you harvest your fields, don't harvest everything. Leave the edges of the field unharvested. And if you have a vineyard, don't pluck all your grapes. And if grapes have fallen on the ground, leave them there. Why? Because there will be people that will walk by your field that may be poor, marginalized, or they may be an immigrant walking through the area. And God said, you can be generous by leaving that untouched so they can eat without shame or guilt or feeling like they're stealing something because it's been set up for them. This is the posture God is introducing to humanity. He's teaching us, this is how we treat other humans. We set it up so they can just pick it whenever they need and there's no shame 
or guilt. So let create edges of field in our life that actually set up for some of you, it might be $5, might be a whole edge of a field. Guess what? Have that in your pocket, and when the moment comes, it's like, all right, that's the edge of my field right there. For some of you, it's something else. But have your life set up that not everything is accounted for. There is room for you to be generous, and there's no shame or guilt attached to it. Now, if you want to write this down, I'm going to read through a bunch of scripture. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 says this. Honor the Lord with your wealth. Look at that word, your wealth. And with the first fruits of all your produce. You later in the book, Proverbs 29, verse 5 says this. The plan of the diligent leads surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty only comes to poverty. Notice the word wealth in the last passage, and notice the word abundance. It's actually designed within the ecosystem of how the kingdom works. Now, in Acts chapter 4, we're going to read verse 32, 34, and 35. Verse 33 is a great verse, but I just want to read these three verses. All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had, that there were no needy persons among them, Far from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Here we see an incredible culture and community of generosity as a result of the Holy Spirit coming in Acts chapter 2. As the early church is exploding, people said, we're going to make sure that no one is in need. Now, you might think this hasn't happened. This is alive and well in the church across the world today. How many uh, remember recently we had a pandemic that kind of went around for a little bit there? You guys remember that moment? And when the pandemic hit, we were in California at the time, and as you know, the world shut down. And as, as a business owner and as a church leader, sorry, back up, business owners or nonprofit leaders, pastors, all of us were like, how are we going to keep going? What's going to happen to all the economics in regards to all these organizations? And the opposite thing happened when we thought it would go down. It multiplied many fold. What happened is the church rose up during the pandemic. The body of Christ rose up in the pandemic and said, you know what? We're going to give more than we have before because everyone is in need. So I love this, that when our response to need is we give. We give generously, and we give without the scarcity mindset, and it's alive and well today. If you want to write down Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Last verse for right now, 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I've curated these six, seven passages for this reason. I want you to understand the Bible has a lot to say on it, and it's the spectrum. It's not only one dimension of it. I'm actually talking about wealth, abundance. Hey, don't fall in love with money because money, the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is not evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. And then in times of desperate times, the church has an opportunity to rise up and be the one, the leading the charge and being generous. So all these verses give us the spectrum of God's conversation around this. Now let's transition into the dimension of tithing. I want to present to you tithing today. And I realize many of you, as the slides in our surveys indicated that many of you are familiar with this topic, but I kind of want to start at this level and then we'll work our way into it. Tithing is, is a concept that lived today, even today. The whole idea behind tithing, is it's 10% of your income. It's actually given to God through the church. That's the concept of tithing. But before we dive into that, I want to back up and give you a 30,000 foot view that I believe is necessary and helpful. When you look at scripture, there's a couple of different frameworks. The easiest framework that we're all familiar with is Old Testament and New Testament. The Bible divided, not in half, but it's divided in two. And you have Genesis through Malachi, which is the Old Testament. And then you have Matthew to the book of Revelation, which is the New Testament. You can also reframe that to Old Covenant and New Covenant. Now, I, the caveat for me would be Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the book of Acts 
is primarily with the life of Jesus. I would say the life of Jesus was the bridge from the old covenant to the new covenant. It wasn't just overnight. Jesus was actually introducing the new covenant throughout his life. But when he died and he rose from the grave, it sealed the deal. But I also want to propose another framework that I think would actually be even more helpful, specifically in the area of tithing. There's actually, when you dive into the Old Covenant, one of the common themes is you'll talk about the law. You might ask, well, what is the law? The law originated and started around Moses. Moses received what we call the Ten Commandments. Do not murder, do not steal, do not lie, do not commit false adultery, etc., etc. Those are the Ten Commandments. But as you go into Old Testament more, you will learn that God actually introduces more commandments and more what he called, this is my law. If you follow my law, this is what happens. So it's not just Ten Commandments and God said, have a good life. He actually is engaging with humanity, introducing what is called the law. Now, what makes it even more interesting is the religious leaders, in their best effort, to understand and decipher the complexities of the law, expound it on it, and turn it into more laws. But the reason I'm bringing this to your attention is there's actually principles that were introduced to humanity before the law was ever created. And one of them happens to be tithing. So if you want to look at a different framework, you can go pre-law, the law, and then you can go new covenant or grace. Are you guys still with me? So when you look at pre-law, tithing was introduced. There's actually two examples. You can write this down. I'm just going to read them to you. First one is in Genesis 14, 20. This has to do with Abraham. It was actually before his name changed. So at the moment, he's called Abram. And this moment came when after rescuing Lot, he met with Melchizedek. And Melchizedek gave him a blessing. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything that he obtained from the battle he had just won. So he gave a tenth of it to Melchizedek. The other example, and it's actually in Genesis 14, 20. This is what it says. And praise be to God most high who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The other instance that took place, took place before pre-law was in Genesis 28, 16 through 22. This is when Jacob, some of you are familiar with the story, where Jacob lays his head on a rock to go to sleep, and he has a vision, and in the vision he sees a ladder going from here up into heaven, and angels are descending and ascending. This was a prophetic imagery of what was going to become normal, the interaction between the kingdom of heaven and humanity. So Jacob has this dream and this vision, and he received the blessing from God, and he promises God to give a tenth of all his possessions. So the concept of tithing and tenth and 10% would be for the law, whatever came about or whatever introduced. This is important because this is actually something that's on God's heart before he codified it into the law. Are you guys still with me? So the, the, the way that you can look at tithe is a pre-law concept that was codified into the law. Now the question remains, does the cross, the death and the resurrection, does it remove that? Is it no longer the law? We're going to get to that in just a moment. To give you more context for tithing, some of us think 10% is crazy. If you really want to dive into the tithing concept in the Old Covenant, it actually ends up anywhere from 20 to 33%. And I'm going to introduce to you, if you've never heard of this, it's actually, I find it very fascinating. There are different types of tithing. If you want to geek out with me, geek out with me, because we're going to do that. The first one is the type of offering with a certain kind of tithe. And it's where we predominantly get our idea of tithes and offering is this. It's usually an offering to God, but it can be to another human being. It was a certain kind of tithing. Another kind of tithe would actually coin the tithe of tithes. And it was a 10% tithe of produce that you would give to the Levites. Now, if you're unfamiliar, there are the 12 tribes of Israel. One of them was the Levite. They were, by God, designed to not own any possession. So their primary responsibility was ministering to God. And so because of that, he instructed the 11 tribes, the other 11 tribes, you need to take the tithe of tithes a tenth of your produce and give it to the Levite because they need to be taken care of because they can't do what you can do, but it's your responsibility to take care of them. So that was called the tithe of tithe. 
There's another tithe called the first tithe. It was a tithe of produce to charity, to any act of charity. This is where you would give that tithe to. The second tithe was involved setting aside one-tenth of specific agricultural produce during the first, second, fourth, and fifth, and seven, fifth years of a seven-year cycle. So every seven years, the first, second, fourth, and fifth years, you take one-tenth of specific agricultural produce and you set it aside. Because when you travel to Jerusalem to worship, you would bring that with you and you would consume it with you while you're in Jerusalem. Now, think about this. There's no spreadsheets then. Who's managing all this is my question. That's a lot to figure out and manage. There was another tithe called the poor tithe. It required that one-tenth of produce grown in the third and the sixth year, so the off years of that same seven-year cycle, were to give to the Levites and to the poor. And the last but not least would call the animal tithe. is a commandment in the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, requiring the sanctifying a tithe of kosher grazing animals, so cattle, sheep, and goat, to God, which would be sacrificed in Jerusalem. So it's just, it's just worth looking at because sometimes we go, man, 10%. I'm like, well, if you really want to go deeper into this conversation, it's actually 20, 30, some say up to 33%. So 10%, pretty good deal if you ask me. But anyway, that's another conversation. But I want to address something here. The concept of tithing is your first fruits. In Leviticus 27, verse 30, it says this, A tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain or fruit, is the Lord's and is holy. And in Proverbs 39, uh, 3, verse 9, we read it earlier, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. So the concept of tithing is not if I have leftovers and it happened to be 10%, I give it to God. It would be before I took care of anything else, the first 10%, my first fruits, I give that to God. Now, I have people ask me often, again, if you have questions, come find me afterwards, and hopefully it's not too many, and I won't have all the answers. If I don't have it, I'll just say, I don't know. But I'll tell you my own experience. I've had people ask me, what if I don't have enough money for tithe? Then I say, if you're asking me, we adjust our lifestyle to make sure we can take care of the tithe. We adjust, we adjust our life. We cut out expenses if that's what it came to. It's not like, well, I guess this month we just can't do it. I'm like, no, we cut something out. We cut something out of our life because it, the concept of tithing is first fruits, not last fruits or middle fruit, third fruit, eighth fruit. It's the first fruit. That's the concept. So now let's dive into the reality of, okay, is tithing a new covenant thing? Is it relevant to us today? Is it something that we should be mindful of or is it something that got abolished because Jesus died and introduced a whole new covenant? So this is where I want to share, this is my perspective. This is from my life and my decision. And I believe I represent my wife. At least at this point, this is how we've lived our life. Tithing is no longer a legal issue, it is now a principle. Because when it's in the law, the idea was if you do these things, this is how you become holy and righteous before God. So it was a legalistic issue. You gotta do these things, if you don't do it, then you no longer present yourself as holy and righteous. When Jesus came and died on the cross and rose from the grave, it no longer became the way that you become holy and righteous. It's through the grace of Jesus you become holy and righteous and presentable before God. But the principle remains. And for me, this is where I settled it. It's because it was pre-law. It was something that was built into the economics of how God worked. Now, if you were to ask me, Eric, is there room for discussion on whether the, the idea of tithing is for a New Testament Christian or not? And I would say, absolutely. The Bible has so many things going on, and we're doing our best in today's context to understand it. But here's what I'll tell you. In all my experience of being a pastor for nearly 30 years and interacting with, as you can imagine, thousands upon thousands of people, and specifically in the area of finances, anyone that I've talked to that said, I don't believe tithing is the New Testament principle. I don't think we have to do it anymore. My next question is, are you looking for reason to give more or give less? If you're looking for a reason to give less, you have missed the entire point of this principle. 
you have missed the entire premise of what God is actually wanting to form you in this area of your life. This is a spiritual formation issue. This isn't an opinion issue. This isn't what I feel like doing. This is, I want to be shaped and formed by this reality that God actually wants me. And the, why, if you ask the question, why we only let God into parts of our lives and not all of it? Like we go, yes, Jesus saved my soul. And then you, all of a sudden Jesus is like, hey, I want in that part of your heart. You hear the Holy Spirit saying, hey, what's going on in that little closet you got back there? What closet? I don't, what closet? And then all of a sudden, I didn't know I had a closet. Wow, I didn't know I had a closet. And there's a lot of little creatures in there. <laughs> what's the point? God wants access to all of you. And for some of us, we have not actually given him access to this area of our life. And I'll present to you the, my reasoning why I think that is. You don't want to give up control. You want to be in full control of your finances. And that's fine if that's what you choose to do. But I want to propose to you, following God means giving up control in every area of your life. Even if it doesn't line up with what you prefer or what you want. And that's where spiritual, spiritual formation comes into play. Like, no, I want to abide by him. Even if I disagree, even if I feel the opposite, I want to be shaped and formed by his principles. I don't want to be shaped and formed by what I'm feeling that day or the crisis, the tragedy that's happening in my life or the season that I'm in. I want to be shaped and formed by something that's transcendent, that's outside of my current moment or season. So if you were to ask me today, do you think there's room for tithing to not be relevant today? I would say there probably is room. There probably is. You can, you can create enough argument and you can create enough context for it. That is true. But I would also say, if you're looking for a reason to become more generous, then great, go above the 10%. <laughs> go beyond that. Like, don't let that limit you. And when you look at the rhetoric of Jesus' teaching, he actually is telling you, hey, where I've restricted you, I now turn you loose. In the Sermon on the Mount, it is over and over and over. Oh, you only want to go a mile when you've been forced to? Jesus says, go two. When you've been slapped on one cheek, give them the other cheek. What's the point? The direction is more and deeper and farther. It's not less and less and less. So I would propose to you when it comes to our finances, specifically tithing, it's not about reducing it to nothing. It actually is a principle that God has set up to actually teach us that this is the spiritual formation issue and this is how we actually can serve the individuals and people that are doing what we will call, in the Old Testament, it was the Levites. It was people that were responsible for places of worship and to take care of the poor and the marginalized and to see people become spiritually healthy. Today, we call them pastors and churches. And so when you give your tithe, you're giving it to God through the church to help build an environment where all those things can take place. That's the idea behind it. You guys are doing great. You're so, I can feel the engagement, and I, and I love it. I, I'm serious. I, I feel you're engaging with it. And for some of you, you're, you got the question mark, look, and I'm glad. I want you to think about this. If you haven't thought about this in a while, hopefully you will now think about it. Because it is a spiritual formation issue. I want to read a couple more passages, and then we'll land this plane. Matthew 23, verse 3. G, verse 3. Matthew 23, verse 23. Jesus is talking. He says this, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, your mint, your dill, and your cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. So in this context, Jesus said, keep your tithing, but don't forget those other matters that are important too. And then you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. This is Paul talking. Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and he says this, Now, about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. What is Paul doing? He's instructing them to set aside something so when he comes he can collect it because there's need in other areas so there is a principle there is a basis for the principle 
in the New Testament, those are just a couple places of setting aside for God's work. Now, here's a couple extra thought that I want to give you before we land this thing. Tithing is a gift of first fruits. There's no strings attached. This is important. Offering is different. Like you give an offering. Like sometimes what we do here, we take an offering for Romania. And it's like that is specific. You give it because you want to give to that. But tithing is not like if you use this for that, I'll give it. No, once tithing leaves you, it is a gift to God. Now, you might ask, well, what if it's misused? Guess what? That's not on you. That's on the leadership. So I have a two-fold relationship with tithe and offering and finances. As a human, as a follower of Jesus, I have the responsibility to abide by these principles that, I've taught, that we've taught the last four weeks and more. If you want to know the nuances of practice and stuff, please come talk to me. I love these kinds of conversations. For example... I don't want to just auto pay my tithe. Now, if you auto pay your tithe, that's great. I have nothing against it. But I personally feel like it just kind of leaves the realm of like, this is my gift. So this is what I do. Once a month, my wife and I, I go through all the income and I go, all right, here it is. And for me, it's all digital. It's not like I'm bringing something, but I want that moment. This is just my own level of this for me. I was like, I just want that moment to go, all right, here's my tithe. Here's my first fruits. God, this is yours. I don't want it to be some automatic bill payment that I never have to think about. I want to think about it. I want to feel it. I want it to be a genuine gift. Now, if you're an auto payment, that is your process. I'm just telling you my process. But I have a twofold relationship with tithes and offerings. One, as a human, as a follower of Jesus. Like, this is the principle I've set my life to do from a very young age. The other part of it, because I'm a leader and a pastor in the church, guess who, guess who I have to report to at the end of my life and during my life? I'm accountable not just to you. I'm actually accountable to God, more importantly. So the weight, the responsibility... The, the sobering reality of like, this is your gift that you're giving through studio as your first fruits. We make decisions based on what we do with those funds. That is a weighty responsibility. So that's why I want to challenge you. When, when you give your tithe, it's your first fruit. Whatever, how it's handled is not on you. It's actually determined by the leadership or the, of the church. And in the Old Testament, it was the Levites. And you can read some crazy, gnarly stories when it was misused. God was very unhappy with it. So I just want you to know, I have a twofold relationship with this. I have responsibility as a believer. I don't have responsibility as someone that actually makes decisions in relation to what to do with those gifts. What do we, what, where do we aim these funds at? So principally speaking, in studio budget, this is only one area but we give at least 10% away every year to different ministries and organizations locally, nationally, and internationally. This is just a principle that we built in. So every year when we've reported to you, last year I think we gave 11 or 12%. Now that's just one area. That didn't count other things. 11 to 12% we gave to other organizations and ministries that were doing some amazing work. So that's all of our funds combined that we just set aside principally to do that. So what I want to end today with is this. If that was a lot of information, guess what? It was. Unapologetically. I, I wanted to lay this thing out the best of my ability in a very short format to help you understand my perspectives, my views, as well as what I believe is extracted from Scripture. We are no longer bound by the law. We are now introduced and invited to participate in a principle of tithing and offerings. And that's exciting to me because I want to be shaped and formed by what God says about that. And I want to challenge you as we wrap this up. Trusting God with your finances is deeply connected to your spiritual formation. So in light of that, we're going to do something. Not today. Next Sunday. We were thinking about what we could do in response to spending four weeks. We're going to take an offering, but it's not for studio. It's not directly connected to studio. And so we were, as we kind of crafted this series, like we'd be so fun to find someone locally that we could get behind a vision, a need that they have. And as the church, that we would say, you know what? We're going to take care of that. 
So I talked to an organization this week that we've actually partnered with in the past. It's Mill Village Ministries. If you could put up the slide, the first one. If you've not heard of this ministry, it's a great ministry. They are incredible here in the area, very reputable, very trustworthy. We've had great experiences with them. And many of you have actually given in the past to help give food boxes and healthy produce to people that can't afford it or don't have access to it. If you're unaware, the west side of Greenville is actually called a food desert. There's not that many healthy grocery store options within miles of most of the neighborhoods there. So it's actually something that actually kind of stirs my own heart up. What can we do about this? So if you go to the next slide. Mill Village is a nonprofit farm and produced a distributor that teaches life skills to youth, employs students, and provides access to healthy produce for all in Greenville, South Carolina. Next slide. Here's some of the, the numbers of what they've been doing since 2012. They actually create what's called apprenticeships. I will show you a video next week. It's a really sweet video. They take apprenticeships and they teach young people how to actually grow different produce and the management of all of that and the distribution of it. But not only those skills, they're getting life skills. And the video we'll show you next week really highlights what it's done for this one specific girl. It's really beautiful. Food share boxes that have been distributed since 2012 is over 91,000. And obviously, you can see the pounds of fruit, veggies distributed to fam families, 1.3 million pounds. The next slide is what I want to present to you that we, what we want to do at the church. I called them this week. I talked to Morgan, our very own Nee. I don't know if Nee is here, but Nee is one of our team here. He's on staff at this ministry. And I called him. I said, hey, what, what needs do you have? Like, what are some of the things? Is there anything kind of on the, the larger side that you need help with? And, and so they got back to me Friday and Saturday, this, just last couple of days. And they said, the vehicle that we have that we use to pick up young people, as well as distribute food, produce all over to specifically the areas that can't afford it, as well as don't have access to it. A vehicle is on its way out. We're, it's causing more problems, getting more expensive. I said, well, what do you need? They said, we want to buy a one to two year old truck which is uh, you know, what brand they're going to work on that. But the goal is $50,000, and to distribute fresh, affordable produce to help feed the community, provide transportation, as well as this become the way they distribute community members to grow their own produce. So what I want you to do this next week, if you feel at all manipulated, coerced, or forced, give zero. I have, I, this is not a manipulation point. This is a, an invitation. I want you as individuals, as families, as couples, as friends, housing units, I want you to take the next week and pray. I want you to pray two things. God, are we supposed to give to this? And if so, say, God, how much should we give? For some of you, it might be an easy number. For some of you, it might be sacrificial. But I want that to be between you and God. I don't want that to be between me and you. I, want that to be, I just want to provide an invitation to participate. And I also want to throw another thing in here. For some of you, this might be a repentance offering. What I mean by that is I actually have not been approaching my finances according to how the Bible talks about it. And I need to make an adjustment. I need to make an adjustment, and by doing that, I'm going to give into this to realign myself and to set myself back up accordingly to how God thinks about finances. Others of you can be like, this is just a fun, generous thing to do. I just want to give to this. It's not a repentance thing. So I recognize it might be different for each of us, but I want all of you to feel invited into this opportunity. And I told them, hey, listen, we're going to get back to you. I'm talking to the church this Sunday, and then we will let you guys know. So next Sunday, I want you to come prepared to give, and we're going to take a special moment next week to do that. And so I want you guys to pray about this. Are you guys with me? Great. Why don't we stand? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for, um, not that you had a choice, but for allowing me to go longer. Um, I really wanted to lay this out in a, um, in a way that was helpful and would be a great contribution to all of our journeys when it comes to faith, finances, generosity, and obviously tithing. So I want to pray. We're going to wrap this up, and we'll turn to you guys loose. Jesus, thank you for this journey that we are all on. And thank you that you continually bring us into this reality that we can choose to be shaped and formed by you, or we can choose to be shaped and formed by other things. In other community, I pray for each of us in this conversation that we would hear your voice so clearly, that we feel what you're impressing on our hearts. 
And I pray for all of us in this journey of just finances in general and offerings and tithes and generosity and stewardship and managing money. I pray that this should be an introduction for all of us to elevate, to level up, to step up our game in this area. We don't want to be incompetent in this area. We want to be competent in this area. We want to be a group of people that manages money incredibly well, stewards money incredibly well, as well as we bring our gifts to you as you taught us in principle. And I bless everybody in this room. And everybody said, amen, amen. Thank you guys so much. If you could hold your spot for one moment, if we could have any of our leadership team or any of our studio home pastors, if you could make your way over to that far right of the room. And if you're in this room today and you would like someone to pray with you or to talk with you about whatever's going on, they want to stand with you and pray with you. As soon as I dismiss you, just make your way over there. Other than that, everybody, have a great afternoon. Enjoy the weather. We'll see you next week.